you may have quietly noticed that as uh, Deacon Susan was reading the gospel, our videographer brought this little machine over and placed it here. He told me about it just before the service started in the sacristy, and I, I teased Peter, and I said, you know what this really is? It's a taser. <laughs> so that if you get out of line, now, it's actually a recording device. But I, and I say that as a way of painting a contrast. Because you see, if there was anything in my leadership that would cause you to wonder if that actually might be true, <laughs> it wouldn't be funny, would it? That is precisely the opposite of what Jesus is talking about all through these readings about what the essence of priesthood, in fact, actually is. The word priest is not used. Instead, the word both in the epistle and the gospel reading is the word shepherd. But if there is any word that in fact describes the active present day living priesthood of Jesus, the one who ever lives to make intercession for us, the one who stands before the throne of the Godhead praying on our behalf, it is one who is shepherd who by the very Holy Spirit of God is calling us and gathering us into his own, who stands beside us even in the deepest places of sorrow and suffering, who continues to open doors for us in a way that we could never ask or imagine because he has a purpose for each of us. And in that light, he will do what is necessary, working all things together for the good in such a way as that we are in fact being changed, conformed to the image of his son, who is the very likeness of the invisible God. In the midst of that all-consuming work that literally flows through the whole earth, here comes Peter. Peter being called to take his place in a very specific role to help carry out, be a vehicle for, and a channel through which this shepherding work of Jesus moves and operates in a very specific place. At one level, Peter, you are a priest for the whole church. You could go anywhere in the global Anglican communion and say, I'm a priest in good standing in the Episcopal Diocese of Central Florida. And that would be enough. But you're also right here. You're at St. Albans where they're gonna serve brisket and sweet tea at the reception. <laughs> You're at St. Albans, where everybody still talks decades later about people's barbecue. Yeah. You are a place where people still go out and tend groves. Yeah. And, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I like Polk County. <laughs> but Polk County needs priests. And that's why you're here as opposed to someplace else. Because God has raised you up, both in a universal calling for the whole church, but to express that in a very specific time, place, and location. Much like this parish's namesake, St. Alban, who is patron saint for literally England, and with good reason, because he is quintessentially what you think about when you think about an English Christian. So also, Peter, may God work in you what is quintessentially essential about priesthood in Polk County. Place is important. Even the ministry of Jesus says, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, literally pitched his tent. In other words, he wasn't in Brooklyn. He was in here in Jerusalem, Nazareth, Israel. So here, and because that's the case, in a way that I think should be celebrated, your expression of this universal shepherding priesthood will actually have that kind of tang and accent about it that looks like right here. And might even be terribly out of place in downtown New York City, but should be, you see because that's a very different locus, and as a result, a very different way to express that which is universally true in both places. I, it struck me when we were going through the litany of ordinations 
exactly that kind of specificity because while we were praying universal prayers that would be true for anyone who was stepping into a new place of leadership about being indwelt with the Holy Spirit, faithful in his duties for his family, we also got into mission. So as we're going through that in faithful witness, it may preach the gospel, he actually, to the ends of the earth, I'm thinking Polk County needs somebody who literally can stand up in faithful witness and preach the gospel. That Polk County needs somebody to reach out to those who do not yet believe and for those who have lost their faith, that they may receive the light of the gospel through you and what God has called you to do. That in the midst of even universal prayers like for the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples. So here, that in the midst of the kind of divisions that happen around race and class and whether you're from here or not and all the things that are a part of actually most locations where people have lived for generations, in that place, God might use you to speak a word of peace and forbearance that actually unites instead of divides. That here, in the people who are in res political responsibility, mayor, people in city council, positions of public trust, God might use you to promote the dignity and freedom of every person. You see, it has that kind of deep locus specificity. You see, our, our tendency as Episcopalians and Global Anglicans especially, is to import a kind of model, almost always based on sort of the English countryside of Christian England, and plant that in a location almost regardless of what that might look like. And what that inevitably produces is a kind of cultural tyranny that lays out even a sort of um, snobbishness about the way we do things. Have you ever heard that? I have. <laughs> now, I think that, and so that the, the, the particular of the location bows to the overall arching culture of this global communion, and specifically in its roots, East Coast Episcopalianism, going back to the 13 colonies. And people will even tell you their pedigrees. It should actually be just the opposite. Where the specificity of the community and the gospel intersect in a way that is actually profoundly unique. And so that while there are doctrine and even liturgical truths and customs that expand beyond any borders, it still has the tang and flavor about Polk County right here in this room. That's in fact, you see, a part of the work of priesthood is to take the universal and express it in the location and in the personal so that when you stand here, when you stand there, whether you're in a hospital room or you're talking with somebody on Main Street because you recognize each other and you stop and say, chat in those high how are you occasions as well as the high and holy ones the universalness of the chief shepherd flows through you into the kind of particular so that the people here know that Jesus loves them and that he has a plan for them and they fit into this grand scheme that only God can do to literally bring everything and everyone together in Christ That's my prayer for you. Because if you keep that kind of tender, heartfelt, prayer-soaked location, these people, this locale, that actually will be that, the thing which protects you from the warnings that are given in the epistle about not lording it over, not for sordid gain. All of the things that literally are completely contrary to the gospel of Jesus and his way, you see, of leading.
Jesus, remember, was the one who got into all kinds of trouble because he sat at table with notorious people. He was in places where any good Jew never would have gone. Hung out with people that were very, very um, disreputable. <laughs> Jesus didn't care because they mattered just as much in the kingdom of God as the most important city official, the highest ranking Pharisee. That has everything to do with, I'm to be here. And that in this place, all people matter, no matter who they are, where they've been, no matter what they're from. And even in the places where we have individually or even as a family known deep and personal darkness, none of that shakes you because you know that you serve the one and even more importantly than that, are filled with the power of the one who conquered even death and hell. And therefore, you are not afraid, even when your heart breaks for what you see that people have to endure. And it is in that place of both pain and joy you express the light of Jesus. Learning, even as Jesus described it, that this good shepherd lays down his life. He lays down his life. Don't get, stop, get over that too quickly. He lays down his life. It means his heart has been changed so that he loves them. So that it's almost a second nature act when someone is in need. Of course I'm going to go. That's what I hope for you. That you be known, Peter, as a priest who lives out that kind of deep and profound shepherding. Because you have been shepherded that way. Because you know that Jesus has come to you in the, in the midst of dark places and brought healing and grace and life. Because you know that without his intervention in your life, there's no way that you could be here. This is something for which you in no way deserve, but are in fact profoundly called. And that the whole basis of what you offer is not because of character and strength and stability and leadership development, etc., but that instead you know the secret joy of discovering that his strength is made perfect in weakness. Peter, please stand. So you, my dear brother, as we welcome you into this collegium, this universal place of servanthood, of foot washing, of standing at table to serve. Come and be a part of this. God has opened this door where the strength of Christ may be displayed in your weakness. And that when you walk the streets of Auburndale, when you drive the highways and the state roads in Polk County, you'll know that Jesus has called you here and that here you come and bring the joy and the light of Christ that you know in the very depths of your soul. May God honor that priesthood in you that people here may know the light of the gospel and be brought to a tender, welcoming, joy-filled faith. Amen.